Jonesy, season nine, it's good to be back. Sheesh, nearly into double figures, mate. It uh, feels like it's been a really long time. Uh, both of us have had little trips uh, away from um, the great state of Queensland. You know, we're a bit of a freshen up. We're ready to go. Yeah, we, we only talked about those trips for about, I don't know, <laughs> five, ten minutes from memory. Yes. <laughs> Have, you, have the drifters ever travelled overseas? Because, you know, <laughs> I feel like we were talking like they never had. Yeah. But no, we, we had a blast, mate. We had a blast. Yeah, it was good. The Wink Stakes this weekend. Uh, mm. We have we have some opinions. We do, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's a group one, definitely. There's a lot of group one horses in there. But they're all resuming, mate. So it makes it a little bit tricky. But it'll certainly set the tone for the rest of the spring. Yeah, absolutely. We answer some drifter questions. But, of course, we need to welcome back again our wonderful friends at Ned. Yes, uh, the lovely people of Ned's, people at Ned's have come on board for another season. Uh, sure to be a great spring for them. Um, so if you're going to have a little, you know, a little something, something on this weekend, make sure you do it with the good people at Ned's. Uh, you can do everything that you want with them. You can get weird and exotic. There's the same race Maltese, mm-hmm. which is a great feature that they have as part of the, the Punters Toolbox. Yeah. And there's also the Profiles. Yeah, Profiles are huge. Um, had a few few people jump on last weekend to no avail. But <laughs> that's the risk you get in this great game. But, yeah, the profiles, it's it's not too far away. Definitely. So, uh, full steam ahead for Season 9. Let's go. But what are you really gambling with? For free and confidential support, visit gamblinghelponline.org.au. I need to ask you a question. Be curious, Drifters. Mr. Brightside wins the box and wins again. Sardozzi wins the Oaks for Jay Mack. The photo finish. Mr. Brightside. Pass more Baker's delight in Perth. Radina, Radina just won it. I'd say Tom Kedden won the spring champion in a cakewalk. Without a fight, without a fight, won the Caulfield Cup. Well, g'day, mate. Hello. How are you? Declan Jones for On the Drift Stable. <laughs> Season nine. Season nine. Wow. Hectic. Nearly double digits. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm good. How are you going? Good, mate. First time I've seen your face in a red hot minute. <laughs> it's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, both of us just fresh off our uh, Northern Hemisphere campaigns. <laughs> yeah, some uh, European soirees. Yeah. I made it to uh, Royal Ascot and, you know, I think I had a good prep. Yeah, yep. Um, just flying the Aussie flag over there. Mm. I was I was in. Uh, <laughs> I, I visited a meeting that uh, isn't as illustrious, you could say, <laughs> as um, Royal Ascot, uh, the Galway races, but so much fun. Yeah, back a winner. I did, I did in the first race, but um, there's only five races, but yeah. they race every day from uh, from the Sunday through to the Saturday, I think. Uh, and yeah, back to first winner, fourteen to one. Oh. Lost all my money. <laughs> Lost the next four. So the shortest price favorite all day was like two dollars fifty. Oh. But the rest of the races it was like five or six dollars the field. But there was only one race where the winner was single digits. They're all double digits, mate. It was just chaos. Mate, it was like that at Royal Ascot. It was absolute carnage. It was carnage, mate. The only good thing of the day was Asfura and your boy was not on. He, he <laughs> had to I, back the Aussie. I know. And I was I was cheering her home. Um, but like in that um at there, I was I was backing big Evs. We were, we were talking <laughs> yeah. about big Evs yeah. uh against Asfura, but I had a look at it because I'm like, oh, I think Asfura is racing this week. So I went through a form profile and last star, Big Evs went out and absolutely demolished her. At a Goodwood next start. So I was on the right horse. <laughs> it went too early. Yeah, but I tell you what, Royal Ascot. Big Evs has he was he was up there with thing about it for sweating up and playing up in the yard like any other horse I've ever seen. Mm. He's a young colt with a lot on his mind. Yeah. But has some um, has some speed, just needs to learn how to harness it, Big Evs. Yes. But horses in general, one of the things I, I took away was Royal Ascot. They that is the best bunch of thoroughbreds I've ever seen in person. They mm. just look the two hundred to one pops that that one of them won on the day <laughs> looked immaculate. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Yeah, 
Oh, mate, it's uh, certainly a spectacle I want to add to the list. And you're in the mixer with the paupers. Yeah. <laughs> What's, uh, what's it like being in the mixer at Royal Ascot as opposed to, let's say, maybe a Doobin race course? <laughs> <laughs> well, they sell cigars on track there. Oh, are you kidding? No. So it's like it's actually better watching races in Australia than at the track compared to Royal Ascot. The screen is really tiny and it's weird. Like you almost have to be about 50 meters back from the actual rail where the horse, where obviously the horses are running, mm. but then the the straight is so wide that the horses could be another ten to twenty meters away. Yeah, so it's like they're actually really small. But then you go to look at the screen, and anyone from Brisbane, it's basically like the equivalent doom and screen there instead of Eagle Farm. Oh, it's shit! I was so, there on the weekend to watch our girl Port so be very disappointing. By the way, <laughs> um, and I just I was just looking at the screen. I was like, let's go. I was sitting there, members, and there's this the screen behind the where the you know behind the track where the horses race and yeah. there's like an actual mini TV in yeah. members. Yeah. I'm like, I'm better off just watching that. Literally. And I've got good vision, mate. Yeah. Long-term vision. Some of the best. Um, so, yeah, the punters can, yeah, they can smoke cigars if they have a win or a loss, which is fantastic <laughs> to see. Yeah. Uh, the amount of like, I didn't see Ned's there, unfortunately, but the amount of bookies on course, my God. Mate, Galway was the same. There was a hundred. Like yeah. 100 bookies. It was unbelievable. In a, in a big ring. Yeah. And like me thinking I have the biggest dick in Australia. <laughs> I definitely don't. I'd literally go up to one and be like, he's got $8 for that thing. You've got seven fifty. What are you going to do? And the bookie just be like, I'll give you $7.50. dollars 50 like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, it was so much fun though. Yeah. Right? Like Royal Ascot would be... Um, one hell of a one hell of an experience. But I think just getting to like a like the Galway races, yeah. just being just being in the mixer with um with the locals. Like um, where we were staying, um, we went down to grab some brekkie in the hotel. It was like I don't know, let's say nine a.m. and uh, walk out the front, and there's uh, like a group of like blokes in their like middle aged blokes on the Guinness smoking durries. It's 9 a.m. They're fully dressed. And I was like, well, they're clearly going to the races. Yeah. But the thing is, the races don't start at 12 p.m. like they do for us. No. They start at 5.30, man. Yeah. <laughs> First race is 5.30. I said to the boys, I was like, heading to the races today? Like, yeah, eventually. I was like, starting early. They were just like, yeah, well, you know, we've got to line our stomach somehow. Somehow. And they were there for the entire week. So they were doing that for, what, six or seven days in a row. They know how to do it, the Irish. Yeah, they do. Um, one thing that they don't miss you on at Royal Ascot is the price of the food and beverages. My God, I think it was like 12 or 13 pounds for a Guinness. Oh. It was highway robbery. But the tickets we got, we got a couple drink vouchers with us, so it kind of lessened the blow. Um, So, yeah, as for a one, and some of my best bets of the day were just like falling just short, uh, which was a real shame. Sake. But I won it all back with Pledge of Allegiance in the 4,000 metre race. <laughs> Zero form over the trip. <laughs> and he just led the entire way and just ground him into the earth. But so what also happens, right? <clears throat> so we were, because it was actually really poor to actually watch it um, live from like the track. So we were actually going because there's a massive screen in the mounting yard there. And you see all the all the connections there, like in their top hat and tails. Sick. Just absolutely whipping them home. Um, so, we were like, oh, yeah, we'll do that. And there's a bit of atmosphere there. Anyway, I went down uh, to go get beer and come back. And they shut everything off. They're like, oh, sorry, mate. You can't go, go there. I'm like, oh. Because I thought I had like a spare five minutes for a 4,000-meter race. <laughs> And they're like, no, nah, sorry. And I'm like, oh, why do you, why do you cut the, uh, shut this down? It's like, oh, just in case like the king wants to come around. Because the king and queen were on on course. On, on course as well. So, that was disappointing. So, I was watching Pledge of Allegiance win on a tiny little tiny little screen there. But it was still a good win. Winners win. Yeah. Um, something else I noticed as well is, uh, I don't know what it's like at Royal Ascot, but- for some of the races, they don't have barriers at Galway. Oh, uh, were they over the jumps? Yeah. Yeah, that I think that's pretty consistent. Yeah. Yeah. And they just sort of canter up and they just go hell for leather. Yeah. <laughs> it's have, absolute insanity. Oh, it was a five and a half thousand meter bloody jumps race. That's tough. Yeah. Well, it was mm. tough. Mm. Willie Mullins had a few. Mm-hmm. 
Um, he had a couple winners on the day. Uh, like he'd he'd usually have the th- you know the three dollar fifty favorite. Yeah, and then his other horse, Stable, the, 15, the fifteen to one, would win. Yeah, yeah. the pacemaker, of yeah. course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, just makes sense, just right? Finding other ways to fuck yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, mate, we're all us got very jealous. Um, but it would have been a, a hell of an experience. Mm. Um, did you run into many Aussies when you were on on the track? There was a few there. Um, I saw Barakin for Asfura. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, there was tons there. A ton of the palms were on Asfura, mate. She had one of the great plunges, mm. probably the biggest plunge on the day. I think she was like 12 to 1 race morning. She got into sixes. Yeah, well. They knew I didn't. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there was a few Aussies there. I saw on socials afterwards. I'm like, Bjorn Baker was there. Gay was there. Craig Sneesby was there. <laughs> CS was there. Um, and and the rest, I was like, oh. and I was like, they, they were like standing right near where I was. I'm like, how did I miss them? How did you miss all that? There was so many people there, and it was hot, was very it? hot. Yeah, mm. it was like the sensational Queensland weather that we're having right now. Oh, it's just beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it is good. So, outside of the racing, mate, any other trip highlights? Oh, so many. I think, uh, I think just um, drinking Guinness literally. Uh, from dusk till dawn was a highlight for me. It was, it was like a big UK pub crawl. Mm. Yeah, the greatest pub crawl of all time. Uh, I'd say the Scottish Highlands was phenomenal. Um, getting to the Isle of Skye and visiting a couple of whiskey distilleries and blowing myself up on by accident when I did a whiskey tasting. <laughs> it's like, oops. You, you, so you're literally sipping some of these whiskeys. You're like, oh, gee, yeah, it's pretty good. I don't mind that. And you look down at the little like accompanying card with all the, the whiskey – uh, information and the and the tasting notes that the the said whiskey might have, and it's got ABV, and it's like fifty five percent. Holy shit! Damn, <laughs> mate. One of them was sixty percent. Blew Oof. blew me up. Got the bloody C four out. Yeah, right. Um, so yeah, that was great, and and yeah, loved loved Island, loved the races. The races were a real highlight. Um, but the number one uh, jewel in the crown was going to Coolmore Stud. Yeah. Um, get a hat from there or anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> so. so I don't know if we're just different in Australia, but I feel, I feel like Australians are big on their merch. Yeah. Like you go to some shitty coffee store, yeah. coffee cafe or whatever, like down the road from your house and they've got their own T-shirts and caps. Of you course. know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, if you want to buy a coffee and also a $20 cap, go yeah. for it. Coolmore Stud, you know. Um, <laughs> world-renowned. World-renowned. Uh, arguably have had the, the most, you know, Important stallions of the of the sort of twenty first and late twentieth century, the literal big swinging dicks of the horse racing <laughs> <Yeah>. industry, literally, <laughs> don't have any merch. They have no merch. Makes no sense. I did the Coolmore Stud tour in Tipperary, just outside um, Cashel or Cashel or Cashel or however you say it, um, Cashel, um, and they don't have any merch. I was like. This is going to be so easy. I'm going to get everyone who needs to get something from this trip. Just at the end of this, I'm going to, be like, I'm going to get four hats, please. I'm going to get a few pens. I'm going to get some stubby coolers. It's going to be bloody brilliant. Um, but yeah, they, they don't have anything. But it was, mate. So we went to the actual uh, and first property that the Magnias bought, right? Uh, John Magnia. And and I thought there was probably a little bit more history with Coolmore, but uh, it actually started with John. So Tom Magnia, who runs it in Australia, his dad. And it's pure ass how the Coolmore Empire started. Really? So uh, John Magnia and two other blokes, can't remember their name, uh, bought a filly. And she won her first two races and they thought, yeah, she's pretty good. Let's Let's just start breeding her now. So they took her to either Northern Dancer or Dane Hill. I, c- I can't remember. Um, but they're related, and at the time, he was like the number one stallion in Europe. So I'm sure it wouldn't have been a, a cheap uh, cover, right? Yeah. So the first horse that she had was a colt by the name of Saddler's Wells, and Saddler's Wells would go on to win multiple group ones. This is the first horse that they bred. <laughs> Saddler's Wells would go on to be probably the best stallion of all time in in the UK um, until he had a son called Galileo. Oh, my God. So, so literally, John Magnia and co kissed on the penis. Like- like a, 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 uh, It's like winning horse lottery. A biology-like trifecta. Yeah, literally. Unbelievable. So Sadler's Wells, I think, produced something like 60 or 70 individual Group 1 winners, and they were, they were like, yeah, this, this record's never going to be broken. 
Guess who broke it? Galileo, oh his son. God. <laughs> so, That's unbelievable. And so, and the entire Coolmore Empire, which now spans like what, like four stud farms, both hemispheres, multiple continents, all comes from one filly and her first ever uh, foal, a cult by the name of Sadler's Wells. Wow. Absolutely unbelievable. Um, and just the property, mate, is just insane. Like those, those stallions are, um, yeah, treated and some better than a lot of humans would be. Mm. Uh, I was thinking, I was like, cool, I'll, be, I'll get to meet, meet Churchill, who's the stallion of our girl Portsy, completely forgetting that he's a shuttle stallion <laughs> to Australia and where it's now, it's, start, it's breeding season now. So he's damn, I was on the opposite end of the world, but got yeah. to got to meet a few um, big stallions. Justified? Uh, no, he wasn't there. Um, he actually resides in the US, right? Um, but Australia was there, which was cool, yeah. Um, a few others. I can't remember his name. Seamus Ward over there? Or is he here? No, nah, Seamus Ward's here. Oh. Uh, is he's, he he's, cool not, he's not cool more, okay. no. Right. Um, but just, yeah, it was got to meet some stallions, which was really cool. Um, and, uh, yeah, stayed at the Cashel Palace, which is owned by the Magnia family. Um, it is, like, hectic, hectic place, Drifters. Like, I'm talking if – it's like a horse racing enthusiast's wet dream. There's a bar – downstairs in the palace called the Guinness Bar and they just have like um, a lot of like memorabilia and like sign stuff and it's not just like British horse racing, it's also Australian horse racing. Like sent Hutch some some photos of like cartoons of Everest winners, yes, yes, yes. Um, Gay Waterhouse has signed something in there, Chris Waller, so on and so forth. Uh, Black Caviar has got a couple of things in there. Uh, rest in peace. Um uh, yeah, just big biggest highlight of the trip for me. Yeah. Like as as a horse racing guy, like of course. Canal, I was walking around with a semi for, <laughs> for two for two fucking days, mate. <laughs> Nearly passed out. <laughs> well, I'm glad you made it back, mate. Because uh, <laughs> there's there's a lot there's a lot for us to talk to, and you just mentioned it as well. But black caviar, that was really I was I knew exactly where I was when I saw that news. I was in the car coming back from Australia Zoo on Saturday. Australia Zoo. Yeah, belated gift to my dear old mum. So, mm. uh, but yeah, shattering. shattering yeah, it news. sucks. Yeah, it sucks. Um, 18, you know, um, which isn't isn't young, but it's not old, I yeah. guess. Um, <laughs> Middle-aged. Yeah, so really, really sad. Uh, obviously, they did everything they could for her. Um, you know, it's interesting to see all the people who became experts about... <laughs> Horse racing and yeah, and equine health uh, after the death of Black Caviar, but um, oh, mate, un- unfortunately lost the foal as well. Yeah, it's interesting that they don't do that for an unraced filly that has has the same fate. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's interesting. So, uh, but Black Caviar, I think we're actually really lucky from to actually see her for twenty five races at the track, ten time Group One winner maybe. Um, across multiple states international because from what Moods is saying that in the current day, she probably doesn't have more than three starts Mm. because she was that uh, injury prone and I guess her her walk was a bit uh, not as as proper as I guess the vets would want it to be in the current times. Such a a brute of a horse. I think her- um her gait. Her gait was just, you know, you see those athletes who are just enormous. Like, I don't know why he's the first to come to mind, but Marcus Adams mm-hmm. came to mind. Just like built like a brick shit house, but just couldn't get on the field. That is an obscure reference. But you know what I mean? Like, he's, <laughs> he's built like a fucking swimmer. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just couldn't get on the pitch because he's too big for his rig. Mm. Too much pressure on his joints. Yeah. Um, but yeah, from what Moods has said, she, yeah, had issues throughout her entire career and he probably was going to scratch her. Um, from the the race in Royal Ascot, yeah. so the con- still one the compression suit that she wore over there, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable. Like how imagine like putting that order. G'day, mate. How you going? Um, <laughs> bit of a bit of a strange one. Uh, you know that like skins that Jonathan Thurston wears. Like, can we get that except thicker <laughs> and for an equine athlete? <laughs> uh, oh man. So yeah, yeah. yeah Vale Black Caviar, one of our favourites, probably. Probably a, one of the horses in a very pivotal time for us that really got us interested in the great game. Like she was, she was 
the Winks before before Winks. She they're kind of like neck and neck for me for the greatest of all time. Yeah, I think so. I think I think where you could argue that Black Caviar's ahead is the the unbeaten record. Yeah, and she went overseas and did it. Yep. Um, which which Winks did not in but, our most difficult. Um, I guess category of racing, yep. sprint racing, and and to see the horses that came out post her retirement who raced against her, like Haylist. Yep. He in any other era he'd be a ten time Group One winner, and I mm. think he probably ended up with three or four maybe mm. because of Black Caviar. So, mm. and there's a couple others buffering, mm-hmm. like <laughs> like Buff Buff went over to he R&P, Dubai, didn't he? yeah, yeah. Dubai, yeah, which is hard to do. Um, so yeah, the big Buff. Mm. Anyway, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Now, we are feeling generous to kick this season off. So, what we're going to do, you might be seeing it on my head and Declan's head at the moment, but we have some new caps that the order has finally come in. So, they will we will put up put them up for for you to buy somewhat soon, but it's a bit of a process. So just just calm down, take it easy and be patient. But one lucky listener will have the chance to win themselves one of these. We also have some of our old cord caps, the the version one with the old logo. <laughs> so the vintage, they're a vintage edition. But the best review from this week's podcast will win themselves one of these and one of the old caps. Uh, so what you'll need to do is give us a five-star rating. And um, ideally, this would be on Apple Podcasts because that's where the reviews really live. But if you do listen on Spotify, give us a follow on there and reach out to us on IG with some nice words of uh, encouragement as well. And if you watch on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and drop a comment for your chance to win. So we'll announce that either this Sunday's review podcast or next Wednesday as well. Now, we asked the drifters during the week yesterday to kick things off. Just basically if they had any questions for us. Mm-hmm. Or any predictions that they had as well. So, mm-hmm. I have a prediction here from Adam Anitz. Broad's- Adam Anus. <laughs> yeah. Hello? Old- <laughs> what What the hell? Old double A. <laughs> battery. <laughs> the battery. <laughs> uh, prediction. Broadsiding to win the Cox Plate with J-Car riding. Great take. Yeah. Great take. Uh, particularly with J-Car because he'll be... Is it 49 and a half this year or is yeah, it? Um, yeah, I don't know how that works, but yeah, sure. I think, same I, same weight as Animo, I'd say. I think he can win a Cox Plate. Okay. He was very impressive because we didn't do a review podcast on Stradbroke Day. No, we didn't. Uh, who, was, who was my thing that won the uh, two-mile race? Oh, Allegron. Oh, how good was that? Yeah, so good. And he drifted to $7. Ridicu- anyway. Ridiculous price. So, all right, let's have a look at that Cox Plate market. May as well. It's never too early to look at futures no, markets, especially the best best race we have. Yeah. Um, so, Team Red, Cox Plate. Pride of Jenny, $5. Prognosis, 7s. Via Sistina, 7s. Broadsiding, 12s. So, he's fourth favorite at the moment. Yeah. I'm a. am not knocking Pride of Jenny at all, but I'll definitely take her on as favorite of Cox Plate. Yeah? I think, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like her last run at 2,000 meters was... Pretty impressive. It was pretty good, but I think, um, I, yeah, just I, I think I'd take her on at two thousand meters as more so than I would a mile. Yeah, yeah, okay. just just my feeling. Yeah, right? mate, that's fine, mate. And broadsiding couldn't be any more impressive because I think the one knock that we were saying at the time was the rock hard track, <laughs> and it proved to give him another lift. <laughs> <laughs> it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. Maybe it's a really poor crop of two year olds. And maybe he's the best of them, but he's giving me Animo vibes. He's giving me Animo vibes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I think he's actually proven that he loves the slop, which Animo didn't. So no, no. And I think from what I've seen so far of him, of him parading as well, temperament might be a little better than Animo. <laughs> Animo, Animo was a bit of a dude. Yeah. Yeah, he was. And sometimes he didn't want to be there. No. <laughs> no, but on the day, Broadside just took it in. He was like, yeah, all right. Yeah. Yeah, job done. Let's go. So, yeah, I like that. Cooper cordless of lacking yeah. a cord for zero cords. Um, question. Is Pride of Jenny ready to back up the stunning spring that she had last year? Now, I think she's already backed that up in the autumn, but her last 12 months, will she back it up? Oh, there's no reason to suggest why she wouldn't. I think, um, I think the key to her last spring is from memory, you know, she got beaten by Amelia's Jewel and then, 
And then she won two group ones, was it? Like yeah, the Empire Rose and then the Champions? I think she went down in the Turak as well. Yeah, okay. She finished third or fourth in Turak, which uh, that... Um, Patrician yes. won and Tino was yeah. second. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I think the spring she sort of was like, oh, shit, she's, she's jumped out of the ground a little bit and she's run super. Uh, can, can, she, can she back it up? And I think the autumn was more of a learning process for everyone because... Um, Kieran Maher and Declan Bates, I think, okay, what's the, what's the best way to ride this girl? And it's, it's not, it's not just lead on her and kick. It's actually go at a breakneck speed. That's yeah. the best way to ride her. And I don't think they did that every run last prep, no. but when they did, yeah. it was when she ran her best. So I think if she can, if, if Declan Bates can learn how to harness that and do that each and every start. This prep, yeah, definitely she'll exceed what she did last spring and, and maybe even what she did in the autumn. Like she's a $2 favorite heading into the Memsey, um, there or thereabouts, uh, 1,400 meters at Caulfield. So I think um, in the spring, she was sensational. Don't get me wrong, but she also had two leader bias days and then mm-hmm. she backed it up well and truly in the autumn. It's yep. like, okay, yes, she was assisted by that bias, but instead of winning by three lengths, she was winning by... Yeah, whatever she was. And then that Queen Elizabeth was absolutely breathtaking. So, yep. absolutely. Now, Josh Buttonshaw, a comment and a question. That toey for the return of the podcast, fellas. <laughs> Horny. Love to hear it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what group ones will the Prince of Scone, Peter Snowden, be winning this spring? <laughs> uh, well, he's flying solo now, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he is. I have some suggestions if you want to hear me through. Yeah, do that. Drifting. Now, Smart ap- little filly. aptly named yep. for this podcast, but she might she might be our favourite horse. Yeah. Uh, did I have a wager on her last week in the quiz that? No. Did and I? Yes. <laughs> she just <laughs> found the front and just kept kicking. So, I think she's she's a smart one. Uh, bodyguard is another one within there. Uh, they're stable. So, he arguably could have won a blue diamond if he didn't get scratched during the week. Um, the one who I have a love-hate relationship with is the king, king mm. of Sparta. He could win a Matic Carter or something. He could. He could. Uh, or a winter bottom or something? Yeah, he could. Look, I think if if the Snowdens are going to win a group one, or if Peter Snowden, sorry, um, is going to win a group one, is it, I think it's got to be with something new. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a new three-year-old burst onto the scene. Uh, I think Drifting's a smart little filly. I think she's a... Group two, group three, Philly at best. Yeah, personally. Yeah, yeah, and they had that um, that Colt who raced on in the week on the weekend in Sydney against um, Gatsby's. Yeah, ran third, and uh, is it that me- media? No, it was in the China Horse Club silks. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I'll get the name of it. So yeah, I think I think it'll be. You know, I haven't even sort of thought about the Coolmore market, but. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if there was something jump out of the ground. High octane. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So, I think there's some room to move, some room for improvement for the snow, uh, for Peter rather. Yeah, just for, that's just gonna, for Peter. Yeah, that's going to take some uh, just for adjustment. The, the Snowden. Yes. Now, Jordan Sondergold, if you could own a horse for the spring, who would it be? Uh, one with his nuts still attached to be broadsiding easily because yeah. because if he wins if he wins a couple more group ones which I think he will like yeah. how much how much cash am I worth yeah um, and like I love a three year old colt who can measure up at weight for age over mm-hmm. the middle distances so um, yeah he'd be the one for me yeah um, I'd say the other one and he he's a little bit forgotten but he's been in the headlines a little bit after a uh, after a trial this week uh, Giga Kick. That's where my mind was heading is like, do you go for tradition for the three main features, Cox Plate, Caulfield Cup, Melbourne Cup, or do you go for cash? And I was having a look at the cash market for the Everest. I wish I'll be in $4.50 favorite, but knowing I wish I'll be in a moots, it'll probably be his only run for the prep. <laughs> yeah. So, it's like, all right, you have one crack at the cherry, probably not my cup of tea. So, um, the, other, the other cash option is obviously the Golden Eagle. Mm. And moving to the four-year-olds, the favourite in that race is Celestial Legend. Oh, I forgot about him. He's definitely one of mine. He's still got his nuts attached. So, so he, he he's right up there. He could go for an Epsom, mm. like go f- back to back in the like mile 
handicap features. Uh, Don went already winning a Doncaster, so he could win an Epsom. I feel. Then he could potentially just bypass a Cox Plate if it's a bit too scary, and then just w- win the Golden Eagle with a leg in the air, and then come back. You know, in the um, in the autumn, still with his nuts, att- nuts attached, four year old, have a crack at two thousand meters in in the Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. Back uh, back at the scene of the crime of his Doncaster win. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I love I love a um, I love a horse that doesn't aim too high as well. So it's like I've I feel like for the staying horses, the Metropolitan is a very winnable race mm-hmm. if you have the right one. Mm-hmm. Um, now there's a horse racing this weekend for uh, Waterhouse Bot Elias. Yeah, uh, current eight dollar favorite, equal favorite with Faulkner Park. Faulkner Park won't be going there because it's ballot exempt into the Caulfield Cup. That's a horse that is on the up, very very much so. So I'm keen on him this weekend, and I think he's a good bet in the Metropolitan. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, before we get into the previews, we've already been here for about half an hour or so. But, Fucking hell. But you can send us a text message. If you're listening to this podcast right now on your podcasting apps, have a look at the description. You'll see at the very top that you can send us a text to get involved in the show. So if we've said anything that you know you want to counter, counter what we're saying. If you feel like you have an opinion that's worth sharing... You know, think twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you don't want to get roasted. Yeah. Um, share it. We, we're, we're keen to have a chat to the drifters. Yeah. The best thing about horse racing is, is you know, every, every, every opinion is valid. 100%. 100%. The opinions might not be, not, might not be right. They might not be. But uh, that's okay. Mm-hmm. Let's go to Randwick. Race five. Soft six at the moment. A little bit of little bit of rain around, but I think it'll be an improving track. I think it'll be, you know, if it's a soft five, it'll be a soft five that's improving. If it's a good four, it'll be a juicy good four, which is all yeah. I see. Yeah. So rail out three meters. Let's start race five. The Premier's Cup, two thousand meters, uh, group three contest, open handicap. Calipore is your top weight with sixty one kilos, right down to political debate at fifty three. Elias is the one I kind of talked about he was absolutely dominant in the mayor's cup loved the trials he's definitely the um horse to beat he's drawn to do no work the only thing i had a look at this speed map there is nothing here i have no idea what's going to take it up canberra legend's been forward before um and i actually didn't mind his trials but uh you can have him (sighs) I think Elias is going to be really hard to beat, mate. I really do. I think the other one that you're probably, speaking of Peter Snowden, that you could have a throw at the stumps with at $8.50 is touristic. Um, just because he's into his prep and his rock hard fit, he mm. might, you know, um, he might just get the one up on Elias when Elias is resuming maybe. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, Elias is a horse, like you said, who's, who's destined for bigger things than this, I think. Yeah. French horse. French. Uh, Palais Francais. Yes. Um I've forgotten how to say hello. Bonjour. <laughs> Were you not watching the Olympics, mate? Oh, I was loving it. Did you watch any of it? Yeah, I did. But being being in the UK the entire time. You were doing stuff. Yeah, I was doing stuff during the day when the Olympics was on. But it was still going by the time we got home at night. But it was, you know, each hotel only had the BBC. And, mate, I tell you what, the English, like... They they would be showing replays of one of their shitty athletes who who in their words won a won a medal in a in a in an event two days prior and they've scraped home for bronze in fucking I don't know something like diving or some running event and they just show it on replay. And it's like it's like can you just put like maybe the basketball on where Serbia is playing Australia? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know, I know, I know, I know. Great Britain's not involved in this, but <laughs> but like, can you show some something else, please? Yeah, can you show some respect? And they celebrate like a bronze is a win. Yeah, no. Whereas we're like bronze, yeah, well done, but like you didn't get the gold, bro. And that's the currency we're talking. Yeah, Aussie gold. Yeah, exactly. Green and gold. Yeah, exactly. It's in the colours. It's in our DNA. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're winning. We're, we're winners. Yeah, I think. Uh, behind New Zealand, we're the best sporting nation. Like based on the per last- capita. Like we had, I think, 18 golds, mm-hmm. I think. Yep. New Zealand had nine, which is unbelievable. That's crazy. That is, for 4 million people, <laughs> that is unbelievable. That is crazy. So, um, yeah, huge effort by the Aussie Olympians. Loved it. Loved every minute of it. <laughs> yep. Now, the Silver Shadow Stakes is race six. 
1,200 metres group two for the three-year-old filly. Set weights, penalties. Manal, who won, what did she win? She won the English Sires. She did. Just over my guy, Traffic, Traffic. Warden. God damn it. T-dub. Uh, now, $2.40. Well, it's, that- just a, it's just a question, I think, this race of if you're comfortable backing the fact that Manal's just so much better. If you think Manal's so much better, you're happy to take her with 58 kilos from gate four at $2.45 with the good people at Ned's. Like, do I think that though? I don't know. I don't think so. Especially once they transition from two to three, like things can just jump out of the ground. So mm. I'm, I'd probably be inclined, and I need to look at this race a bit more closely, but I'd probably be inclined to look at something that's, I don't know, maybe a bit more lightly raced and, and has a bit more scope for improvement. Um, that's got a bit of weight relief, I'd say. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Chateau Miraval is the one that I found at $13. I was not expecting that price. Um, she has been trialing super, uh, really, really nice. Um, her latest one was against some of the older horses as well. Mm-hmm. And she was only beaten two lengths, but she wasn't really asked to do too much. Um, the other one in here, Amina, who was- I a, thought Amina. A little bit disappointing in her at the end of the her last prep, but- could have been a young horse. Yeah, I think I think she she was just a two year old who it came a bit too soon for her. And I think and the Freedmans have a really high opinion of her with the J Mac booking. I I think Amina is the one that I'm leaning towards. And I, you might not have seen this, but I'm I think I'm on this season again. Shit. So her first trial was in Doomben. So her second trial was in Randwick. She's had two trials. The first one Doomben. Which makes me suggest that she's been spelling up here. Oh, which I love that. I love to see Get that. Get her out of the cold, wintry uh, conditions of Sydney and in Melbourne. Get her up to the sunshine state where she's more comfortable. So, Amina has, I assume, been spelling up here as well. So, want to take on the favourite Chateau Miraval Amina for me. Zai Tung, Licky Tung. <laughs> <laughs> Very impressive winner uh, in a midweek at Canterbury um, for Godolphin. Has put a couple together. Uh, want to see want to see her do it against this grade though. Yep, fair enough. Now, the Show County Quality twelve hundred meters Group Three um, handicap. Who have you got here? Because Jolly Star is your three dollar thirty favorite, Jewel accepted, but I'm pretty sure she's going to this one. Yeah, from what I've read, I think she's more likely to be here. I'm with her. Um, so she wins the thousand guineas, which was that the later edition at Caulfield last year. Didn't see her for twenty one weeks. Comes in, wins the Arrowfield Sprint, and that's a as far as Group Twos go, that's right up there in terms of quality each and every year. Uh, the Arrowfield. And it was a diving finish, but for her to do that first up after not racing for oh. so long after a couple of trials, well, that's a hell of an effort. Against some Colts, that would have been third or fourth up. Yeah, like, with with that being their, you know, their main target. And there's there is subsequent winners galore out of that race. Corniche finished fourth. Arkansas Kid just went out and won on the weekend. Schwartz won again. Um, yeah, very very strong. <laughs> yeah, so. So I want to be with her, and I think there's probably some intent with her. You know, Chris Waller has been chatting. Could she be my Everest horse potentially? I think he would have learned a lot from trying to make um, Zoo Gotcha a sprinter this time last year. I, Jolly Star is not Zoo Gotcha, obviously. Maybe she is more of a sprinter. Um, again, J Mac on. He, you know, he rode five last Saturday. Like fucking hell. How many? How many times does J Mac get down to fifty four? Not very often. Yeah. I think that's telling as well. Not very often. So yeah. I hope she's here. And and because of the nature of the race as well, like like Southport Tycoon's got to carry 59. He's first up um, over 1,200 metres. He nearly won first up over 1,200 metres last prep. Democracy Manifest is a good horse, um, but he's just resuming. Yellow Brick's a bit of a cat. <clears throat> um, the one I couldn't place was Airman. Really disappointing prep last prep. Um, I have to say it. But- he has some pretty decent first up form. Like he's never been out of the top three, but I, I agree. I need to see it. Um, and he's one of my best mates 
uh, after giving me one of the great fill ups on Grand Final day last <laughs> yeah. year. Yeah, um, I'm just I'm looking at this race and I'm I'm seeing two horses that I think are Group One caliber. One's already got one that's Southport Tycoon, and the other one I think is Jolly Star. And she's weight is so much better in this race with J Mac on. Yeah, and I think she's more of a 1200 meter horse than what Southport Tycoon is. So. Well, that that leaves her yeah. as the one to back at, yeah. at, a, at, a, at a backable price. Yeah, I think so. I think she'll start shorter than that. Now, the Winks. Let's just go in race order, hey? Uh, the Winks stakes. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get up what the drifters are reckoning here. So, ask them who are they? Who are they? Who are they on here? Cooper Cordless, whatever J Mac is on. <laughs> Good strategy. Good strategy. So that's Fangirl at $2.20. Benny Carroll, Fangirl. Uh, Cooper, both. Got to be Fangirl, but have no idea how good Via Sistina is over this distance. Mitch Felton. Fangirl first up, yes, please. Josh Buttonshaw, silly questions, fellas, drifting next year. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big Peter, Peter Snowden fan. Big Peter Snowden. I think guy. he might be working for the Snowden, uh, for Peter. Fuck. Uh, anyway, so... How did you see this contest? Fangirl, $2.20 after a little setback in the autumn. That is, and she's not a good trialer at the best of times, right? But trials have been dross. They've been real dross. They've been dross, the trials. I, I want to take her on. I think she, I, I, Fangirl, like I'm not a fangirl guy. Like I'm not a, I'm not a fanboy of fangirl. I, I, I really like her. I think she's a good horse. Um, from that gate, she goes back. She gets J Mac, which you know that's a that's a match made in heaven. Those two, I think he's five from seven um, on Fangirl. She'll probably get a drying track, which is great. Oh, and she could have died from that injury that she had. Um, I thought it was just a clip to her leg or uh, something. No, nah, apparently she was she was not good. Yeah, right. So, and based on those trials, I'm, I'm thinking Chris Wallace also got an eye on the Cox Plate with her. She's so, already already nominated. So for me, maybe she's not going to be as sharp first up as what she was this last time. year. Um, but could also just sit off them and absolutely brain them. Um, the one I was looking at, who I think was a little bit un- was a little bit forgotten before the barrier draw, was Riff Rocket. Yep. First up over fourteen hundred meters last prep, just put him to the sword, and we were thinking. Fuck, does this does this guy win the guineas and then just win an Australia Cup? He didn't do that, but he won a bloody. <laughs> Um, oh. He won the Rose Hill Guineas and then the bloody Australian Derby. I had some sick beats in the autumn. Cheerwolf. Oh, oh fuck. Gross. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, so so Riff Rocket for me, like imagine if he's taken improvement from from the autumn and, and he comes here and, and he's and he's the you know, he's he's the new gelding on the scene that could dominate the wait for age scene. I just <laughs> Just with that gate, hot Nash on, I, I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, Chris Waller probably wants to get Roof Rocket, if not a Cox Plate, probably to a Caulfield Cup, I'd imagine. So could he do it first up? Maybe. Yeah. Like he's he's got the talent, but I, again, you've got to risk some. Um, I reckon he could go towards like a Turnbull or something. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But all right, just counterpoint, right? That 1,400 meter contest. Very good. Very fantastic performance. This mm. is who he beat. King Colorado, <laughs> Verdad, Otago, Hey Fat Cat, Cap Farrar, uh, going down the order here, Tanhauser, that was before the gelding operation, <laughs> to be fair, <laughs> and a Mur. So the form's, dross, yeah. the form's not there. This this And this is a good group one. Yeah. Um, I don't think it should be a group one because it's not a grand final, but it's a good quality field. It's a good field. field. Um, <clears throat> hate the silks, but- you know, noticeable change. Number 11, Tropical Skull. Wow. Forgotten horse. Forgotten horse. And she's already come in. She was 11 bucks when I was looking at this earlier. And um, a lot, there's a lot of back markers in this race. Mate. Do you know what she does? She zooms forward. She zooms forward, makes her own luck with Adam, Adam Hippopotamus on. Like, sure. Would I have preferred Barrier 3 over Barry not, uh, Barry 11, rather? Sure, I would have. But yeah. it doesn't really matter. Not in, this, not in this race. No. I don't think. Um, I would not be surprised if she steals it. Uh Something I've said on the podcast before, and I'm going to stick to it though, is I think the four-year-old mares, I think they're just a little bit disadvantaged when they come into the weight for age ranks in the spring. And I think they get a lot better when they transition to being a five-year-old. And 
There's two mares who've done that, and that's um, number nine, Zugotcha, number 10, Samana. Samana's got some residual fitness. I would not be surprised. Only horse in the race that has that residual fitness. She was one that I've – she's definitely in my numbers could, because of that. She she was super. Didn't miss the top three last no. prep. Um, Kieran Ma wouldn't be surprised to see him spoil the party, but I've got to be with Zugotcha. I think for her, she she's not stretching out to 2,000 metres like all these other horses. And I think Chris Waller has probably kept his cards pretty close to his chest, you know, because he doesn't want to spruik which, whichever one of his horses because he's got all the most important owners in Australia to please. <laughs> Fucking hell. Like he's – look at this. He's got he's got Yulong. He's got Deb Capetus. He's got Aussie the, Kerr. The, the Inghams. He's got Aussie Kerr. He's, he's got, got Craig. He's got Craig. He's got um, – Noel. Noel. Gal, uh, Noel for, you know, um, Zugotch's silks obviously like – like bro, bro's got some people to keep happy. Um, Are you shaking hands on the weekend, Chris? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Out of all these horses, who's the one who's a 1,400-meter horse? Uh, yeah. Zoo gotcha and Fango. Exactly. Like they're the, uh, not even Fango. Fango's a miler. Yeah. yeah but, but she, but she could she uh, put him to the sword over 1,400 meters. Yep. But she's Zooey's got is the one with the... I don't see a lot of pace here, and I can see her being parked up just behind Tropical Skull. Wow. With Tommy Berry, who's due for a win. Um, and she was she was eleven bucks when I was looking at her earlier today, maybe ten bucks. And I'm thinking to myself, well, well, that's the play for me. Yeah. And obviously a little bit of bias there, but I, I think I think she can get this one. Yeah. But she's not beating any of these as they stretch out over further. No way. Like if she goes to a King Charlie, you know, over a mile, and Fangirl's there, and a few of these other ones are no there. Way. Like I just don't think she's that good over a mile compared to them. No. Whereas fourteen hundred meters, I think it's equal equal footing. Yes, so to speak. And I think uh, in the Coolmore in the uh, Queen of the Turf, obviously she won both of those in the in the Autumn and the Millie Fox, all against the girls though. All against the girls. Um, so they they, were- they, aren't, they aren't some vintage boys in this race, but no, but yeah, against the girls. But the girls didn't include Fangirl or Via Sistina at yes, that time. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It did include a tissue who. A tissue just needs Flemington 2,000 metres or 1,600. That's what mm. she needs. Mm-hmm. Um, tropical Squall. Tropical Squall. I think she just has the most intent here. Yeah. Uh, oh, definitely, mate. They, they they know if she's going to win one, it's this one. Fresh exactly. Up. And she's already won two. Uh, two or three. Great one. She's got two. Yeah. She's, she's got won. a surround. Yep. She's won two. This is the perfect opportunity. To just tick that you long wait for age against the boys. Doesn't matter who. Same for Zoo Gotra as well. Um, group one box. So, Tropical Squall on top for me for all the reasons that you outlined. The only thing I will add is she was my on top selection in the Queen of the Turf. I only found out about an hour after the race that she actually had a virus the week of the race. <laughs> That's right. So, I had, I had some shocking luck yeah, in the order, did, mate. But um, if they actually made it to the track. But... I think she's the one. Uh, if she's fit and ready to go, her trial suggests so. Uh, if she's fully fit, no excuses. I think she just leads and wins. Yeah, um, she really could. She could just pull all their pants down. Um, no, look, a fascinating contest and and a good one. I think, you know, but looking through this field, you're looking at... Oh, Via Sassina is one we haven't talked about. What are your thoughts on her? Little little bit of a an unknown quantity over this distance for me. I, I, I'm I'm prepared to just leave her here if she wins. Okay, well, who's beating her this prep? Um, but I think she'll probably be one that I want to back once she gets out to two thousand meters. Yeah, second or third up, I reckon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I want to see her go around. You know, I had a fantastic trial. My old mate, old detonator. Detonator Jack. He had a great trial. Um, now, try, what I've learned with trials is they mean- <laughs> Dilly squat. They mean nothing. <laughs> Dilly so, squat. But I think for the detonator, he needs he needs further and he needs a heavier track for me. But uh, Buckaroo's been gelded. Not the worst at 61 bucks. I think he ran a pretty decent race first up as well. So, plenty of chances, but Tropical Squall on top for me and Zoo Gotcha for you might put that in a same race multi- at the good people at Ned's or even a little Quincy. Now, the toys show quality. 1100 meters group three, Jolly Star officially scratched, which is good to see. So, J-Mac doesn't have a ride here. Phillies and Mares open handicap. 
I think, is it is it time to trust Luke Pepper that he's just going to give Opal Ridge the King of Sparta treatment and just run her every four to six weeks? <laughs> she can definitely win this first up. Like 12 bucks. 12 bucks is a great price for her. It's a big price. Um, the two that I, I was looking at, though, don't, sort of mm, the Black Cloud and, and Commemorative mm. um, are probably the two sort of more fresh on the scene down in the weights that that I think uh, I think I might be leaning towards. But yeah, Opal, <laughs> like like eleven hundred meters, like she hasn't missed the Quinella. Uh, first up, her record reads five starts for four wins in a second, like. At that price, I'd be I'd be pretty mad at myself to let it go around without me. Yeah, um, especially on a drying track. Uh, I, I wonder what they they aim with her. Like I think they sort of with Oprah Ridge, you sort of think let's just let's just try and get some black type with her this prep because she her residual value is there anyway. You know what I mean? Like I don't think she's she's won three listed races and ran second in a group two once. Yeah, so get get a group two or group three win or a couple. I, I don't I can't see her winning a group one. No. No way. So uh I'm looking at her this is group three level and her performance is there. She's run she's run fifth behind Alentia Portrait and Magic Time on a heavy track, which is not a go. And she also ran fourth behind Magic Time, Paracel and Lady Laguna. So that's probably her. Yeah. But I, th- I don't know. I think it's. I think this is a winnable race for her. Mm. Mate, Lady Laguna could win this even though she's got 61 kilos on her back. It's a lot of weight. Yeah, it's a lot of weight, but she's a winner. Yeah, and we, you finally saw the bottom of her at the end of last prep in the Doncaster. She mm. just had enough. <laughs> yeah. Because she, she had one of the longest preps of all time, uh, and she just kept running in the first two. She really did. So, yeah, she could run a good race here. But So, your Black Cloud or Commemorative? Yeah, I just Yeah, I just think um new kids on the block a little bit, you know. Uh Jack Pride with with the Black Cloud, you know, got a couple of couple of wins with her in the in the winter and ease her out and you know, will she take some improvement out of that? I'm not I'm not sure. But um Yeah. Yeah. Don't know about commemorative. She's a big, big mare. Big, big mare. Enormous. Mm. And she's you know, maybe it's just because she's so big, she's still feeling into herself. So, as she gets older, she'll probably get more consistent. But she puts in a good one, then a bit of a flat one. So, until she starts putting it together, she's probably a non-betting proposition for me. Um, but, yeah. Oh, we have one at Movie Valley, don't we? Yeah, there is one. All right. The Valley, race eight, the car line stakes, 1,000 meters listed, set weights, penalties. Probably the best placed horse in all of the autumn, Bold Bastille. How much money in the bank? Seven hundred grand. Three listed races in her back pocket. Sensational placement by Lindsay Park. Sensational. Uh, because she was beaten up on things that weren't very good. Yeah. Uh, you look at these races. There's you know there's a listed race um, in there. There's a, the Blue Diamond Prelude, which where she failed. There's a, there's another listed race, the the Reduce Choice Stakes. So. Like this is big boy stuff now. Like there's nowhere to hide. But I think first up with fifteen and a half kilos, Jamie Carr ripping around the valley, often gone sort of stuff. It could be. It could be the one where she yeah. just jags it. So I, I think she can win. She's three bucks. Mornings in Glory, who plays in the Oakley Plate, um, was terrific last start when he brained him. When he brained him in a benchmark one hundred, should change him to the the. Uh, when you think benchmark 100, who's the first horse that comes to mind? Uh, Jimmy the Bear. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Uh, and then shortly after that is Pounding, and then <laughs> and then third is Young Werther. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those three. Those three are yeah. the first three that come to mind. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, is he a benchmark 100 sprinter? Maybe. Maybe. Um, but he, he can win this. and um, But, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to back Bulba still. Yeah, I agree. Saw that uh, Tony with Golden Boom and Antino and other some others. Mm. Natuno, mm. he's got a he's got a bit of a. I think he's he's looking at that Manicato going like that is up for the taking. It could be. It yeah. could be interesting to see what he does with Antino. Maybe he has another crack at the two rack. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> because he was dis- like he was f- phenomenal first up, and then you have to say he's dis- is disappointing for the rest of the prep, Antino. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately. Yeah. Maybe, maybe just keeping him at those sprint distances, maybe the first up's fine, mm-hmm. but then he needs to go to 14, then he needs to go to 16 as opposed to mm-hmm. 12, 13, 14. But, um, yeah. Well, yeah. Acromantula. <laughs> oh, the WA thing. Yeah. Should be up there on pace. But, yeah, this is a good little contest. Not a betting race for me. I do like Mornington Glory. I think he's a progressive, even though he's only he is six. I think they've kind of figured him out because mm. they were going to retire him. Mm. Then they brought him back and he's been bloody consistent. So, Griff is an interesting one as well. Yeah, the, uh, the Kieran Ma thing. Yeah, he won the Caulfield Guineas last year. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's right. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Just jumped out of the ground, didn't he? Something like a Kieran Ma horse. Yeah. <laughs> Something in the water. Yeah. Um, we would obviously like to welcome back our fantastic friends at Ned's as well for season nine. Mm-hmm. Yep. Good, good to have them on board. Yep. Great to have them on board. Um, and probably, probably an exciting announcement I'd say at some point this spring that we can share with you guys Yeah, regarding, um, I'd say the Entain family. Yes. I'd say, because we're part of that. Yeah, we are. Uh, and something else that I wanted to point out, Drifters, um, we'll be running a group one competition. At some point in the spring, we're probably aiming to kick it off for that Friday night, the Manicato, which I think is the 27th. AFL something. Grand Final Weekend. Yeah. Um, look, the finer details will be sorted out at a latter point, but we want to get you guys involved in a group one tipping comp. Um, obviously, there's a group one this weekend, but we, in our opinion – Things don't really start heating up until, you know, late September, um, October, really. Like um, when footy season's done. Exactly. Um, so, the, the the real shit, you know, not this first up. Um, dross. Dross. So, yeah, uh, tipping comp will be uh, up for you to participate in, but we'll be flogging that for the next four weeks or so once yep. we've figured out what exactly what we're doing. Leave a review, uh, send us through to us, Spotify, Apple, wherever. You can win one of these and one of the old cords. If you watch on YouTube, like the video, comment. Uh, subscribe, subscribe is a good Subscribe, that's good. Yep. Yep. And uh, if you're listening to this on your podcasting app, send us a text if you want to, if you have anything worth that you want to say. Yeah. If you want to be, if, you, if you've got an opinion and you want to yeah. be roasted. Let's do it. Be my guest. All right. We'll see you Sunday for the review podcast. Chew. All right.